Okay. Hello. So in today's lecture, we will be studying about the icing model. Okay. For that, I'll share my screen. So in the previous lectures, we have studied about ideal gases and over there we had seen examples of magnetic particles placed in a magnetic field and what could happen to them. So over there we had say some particles with spins having their own kinetic energy placed in a magnetic field. So in the presence of the magnetic field, they would gain a magnetic moment as a result of which um, they'll have a, a non-zero value of magnetic potential energy, right? So we had solved, calculated the partition function for those kinds of systems. And from that, we had derived the free energy and the entropy and other extensive quantities, right? So an important aspect at the icing model is a, a generalized model of what happens when you have certain number of particles, magnetic particles, which have spin placed close to each other and they have an interaction among themselves. So in the previous problems, we had uh, neglected the interactions completely among the particles um, with each other. OK, so we had considered only non interacting particles. Now, suppose what happens if there are interactions among them? So a given particle, its spin can interact with the nearest neighboring spins or it can also interact with the next nearing neighbor neighboring spins and so on and so forth. So all these uh, things are described by a general framework, which is known as the icing model. So icing model is a model of a ferromagnet or an antiferromagnet on a lattice. It was uh, first shown that in dimension d equal to one, the model does not have a phase transition for t greater than zero. Here t is a temperature. Okay. So at this is an important part about the icing model, which we'll cover in today's class that in d equal to one dimension, it does not have a phase transition. On the other hand, for higher dimensions, it can develop a spontaneous magnetization, which can go away as we raise the temperature. So let us consider a lattice. You know, a lattice is a periodic array of sites with equal separations between them. So let us consider a lattice in D dimensions of sites which have spins SI and the sites are labeled as 1 to N. And in D dimensions, it's a high, you can take it to be a hypercube. For example, in one dimension, it is a line. 2D, it's a square. Three dimensions, it's a cube and so on. Okay. And suppose I have one spin SI placed at each of these sites and the spin can take two values depending on whether they are pointing up or pointing down. So if a spin points up, it takes a value of plus one. If the spin points down, it takes a value of minus one. Okay. So since there are uh, N number of sites in the in my domain, and uh, each spin can take two values. So the total number of energy states the system can have is given by two to the power n. OK. And the Hamiltonian for the system is given in this form. So this curved H is the Hamiltonian. This is equal to summation over sites HI SI minus summation over IJ GIJ SISJ minus summation over IJK KIJK SISJ SK and so on. So let me explain what these terms are in detail. So HI represents the external field at every given point I. For general purpose, it may not be the same at every point. That's why each site can have its own field, which we denote as HI. And what is GIJ? GIJ is the coupling between nearest neighbor spins. So if I and J, so this angular brackets over here represents the nearest neighbor interaction. If angular bracket IJ represents the nearest neighbor interaction. So GIJ is the coupling between the nearest neighbor spins. SI and SJ are the near neighboring spins. Similarly, I can also account for the coupling with the next nearest neighbor spin, and that coupling factor is given by KIJK, where SI is the given spin, SJ is its nearest neighbor, SK is the next nearest neighbor to SI, and so on. So in this way, we can consider all sorts of interactions within this icing model. Now uh, you will see that uh, the partition function for the icing model can be written as a sum over all possible spin configurations configurations e to the power minus beta into the Hamiltonian, right? And we denote this sum over all spin configurations by this symbol of TR. Okay, so TR equal to 
summation over s1 equal to plus minus 1, summation s2 equal to plus minus 1, and so on up to summation sn equal to plus minus 1. And in shorthand notation, we write this in this manner. So within curly brackets, summation si equal to plus minus 1. So this is a configuration sum which was covered earlier in most of our classes. And then once we get the partition function, which can be written as tr of trace of eta, tr meaning trace, trace of e to the power minus beta h, we can derive the free energy as minus kvt into log z. And once we get the kb uh, free energy, we, we can calculate a number of extensive properties, like we can calculate the magnetization of the system, which is nothing but the expected value of the spins SI. So expected value of spins SI is the magnetization per site. And if we multiply that by the total number of uh, spins that we have, we get the total magnetization. All right, so this covers the introduction of the icing model. Now let us look at a few characteristics of it. So what do we mean by the thermodynamic limit? Thermodynamic limit basically means we take the system to have a very large uh, size, right? So we take n going to infinity. And in this limit also, we find that the partition function is analytic, meaning that we can find the free energy from the partition function by taking its logarithm. Okay. So this is what we mean by taking the thermodynamic limit of the system. Also, it should be noted that uh, GIJ in general, this uh, coupling term, it can have um, and it can have a value which depends upon the distance of the spin of the other spin from the ith spin, right? So if R is suppose the distance of the gth spin from the ith spin, then GIJ can have a form of A by R to the power sigma. Then for the thermodynamic limit to exist, that means for the partition function to exist in the limit of n going to infinity, we must have the uh, we must have the constraint that sigma is greater than d. Okay, this is uh, this is necessary for the existence of thermodynamic limit. So what does this mean? That for example, in three dimensions, this means that sigma should be greater than three. So this uh, term then therefore this excludes the dipole-dipole interactions in three dimensions. Okay. Now there are a number of analytic properties which the free energy might have. For example, here are some of the analytic properties of the free energy that the free energy is always less than zero and it is a continuous function. So del F del T and del F del H, they exist almost everywhere. But it should, one thing to note is that at the transition point, there is a discontinuity in the free energy. So which is why uh, that means uh, not at the transition point, in fact, um, when there is uh, when all spins are pointing up or pointing down, that means there is a spontaneous magnetization in the system. Then there is a discontinuity in the free energy and the discontinuity accounts for this uh, spontaneous magnetization. OK. Also, entropy can be written in this term as minus del F del T and it is uh, greater than zero almost everywhere. So this is the entropy per side. So here are a few characteristics of the free energy function which might occur which uh, is there for the icing model in general. Now, let us look at how one can solve the icing model exactly in 1D. So in 1D, the Hamiltonian can take this form, which I had earlier over here. So the Hamiltonian stays the same. Here we make a few assumptions. One is that we neglect we consider the external field h to be the same at every point. So that's why I've taken hi out of the summation like this. And we also assume that the nearest neighbor interaction coupling, so the nearest neighbor coupling is constant. That is, it's the same for every pair of nearest neighbors. So we take j outside the summation as well. And we also assume that uh, the there is only nearest neighbor interaction between spins and they do not interact with their next nearest neighbors. So this simplifies the problem down even further. So what happens is that basically I can take j to be equal to i plus 1, right? And then I can write the summation in terms of a summation over i only, with which, uh, which contains si into si plus 1 within the summation. So if that is the case, then the partition function can be written in this manner. Now we introduce two variables, small h and capital K, where small h is equal to beta into h, and capital K is equal to j beta. OK. And using the condition which I mentioned earlier about the nearest neighbor interaction, I can write this as a summation over i si into si plus 1. And that is why 
the partition function can be written as the summation over all spin configurations. Exponential of h into summation si plus k into summation i si into si plus 1. All right, now first let us consider free boundary conditions. That is, no, there is no constraint on the boundary spins and the external field is equal to zero. So in this case, the configuration sum can be broken down into a product of summations over the spins at the individual sites into e to the power k into some instant i si into si plus one. Now let us define a new variable eta i, which is equal to si into si plus one where i goes from 1 to n minus 1. So then eta i is equal to 1 if both the spins si and si plus 1 are the same. And if they point in the opposite directions, then eta i is equal to minus 1. Okay, so once eta i has been defined like this, I can rewrite this as in terms of the variables eta i itself instead of the spins i. So since there are n minus 1 number of eta i variables, there is an extra summation which has to consider the interaction between the first spin and the last spin with the nearest neighbors. So there is a summation over of sorry, which I yeah. So I had neglected one of the spins over here. So one of the boundary spins S1 is denoted here as a summation of over minus one and plus one into the summation over the variables eta, where there are n minus one number of summations e to the power k into eta one plus eta two up to eta n minus one. Okay, so all these uh uh, terms in the summation of the exponential can be written as individual products and we can do each of these summations individually and once we do that we get z is equal to 2 into 2 cos hyperbolic k to raise to the power n minus 1. Now we implement the periodic boundary conditions that is sn plus 1 is equal to sn and then we can solve the 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 for the partition function using this transfer matrix method. So let us look at what this is. So let us consider that the, the external field is not equal to zero. So if that is the case, then this is the general form of the partition function. Now you see these summations can be written broken down into different parts and written in this way. So this becomes the sum over all configurations. Exponential of h into s1 by 2 plus h into s1 s2 by 2 plus k s1 s2 multiplied by the exponential of h s2 by 2 plus k s2 s3 plus h s3 by 2. So you see we take each pair of spins and for each pair of spins we get terms which look like this. And in that way we get n number of terms where the last spin is coupled to the first spin because of periodic boundary conditions. So you see each term over here it looks like a matrix element of this matrix T which we define over here. So if we define a matrix as T s1 s2 then each of its elements we can write as e to the power of s1 plus s2 into h by 2 plus k into s1 s2. And we denote each element using this notation angular brackets s1 t s2. So here is the I've written the matrix down in its uh, full form where it is a 2 plus 2 matrix because uh, I, it has only uh, two indices, right? s1 and s2. So the matrix can be written you have, so S1 and S2 can each take a value of either plus one or minus one. That's why it's a two cross two matrix and uh, right. And it's a nearest neighbor coupling. That's why it's a two cross two matrix. Therefore, um, I can write it as uh, uh, in this manner over here. OK, so then the partition function nothing becomes nothing but a product over each element of the matrix like this. So it's the sum over all configurations s1 t s2 multiplied by s2 t s2 t s3 and so on up to s n t s1 right so basically if we calculate the product this ends up being nothing but s1 t to the power n s1 inner product okay and since the trace of a is nothing but the summation over its diagonal elements so this is nothing but the trace of this matrix t to the power n therefore uh, the partition function is nothing but the trace of this matrix raised to the power n, right? Now, the thing is, how do we calculate t to the power n? An easy way of doing this is if we diagonalize this matrix, right? So you see that it is a symmetric matrix. Therefore, its uh, eigenvalues must all be real and positive. Okay, so 
since it is a real symmetric matrix it can be diagonalized by a via an orthogonal transformation that is we pre and post multiply the matrix by an orthogonal matrix whose rows and columns are nothing but the eigenvectors of this matrix so therefore the new matrix we get t dash the diagonal matrix is s inverse t s where s is the orthogonal matrix whose eigen rows and columns are the eigenvectors of t and once we do that the eigen values of the matrix t appear along its diagonal then the diagonalized matrix is nothing but has this form that is lambda greater is the larger eigen value and lambda lesser is the smaller eigen value now use we use the cyclic property of trees so what we do is that we can manipulate the partition function in this manner so trace of t to the power n can be written as trace of s into s inverse to the power n this is an identity so this does not change the trees at all now if we use the cyclic property of trace then this s goes to the right over here and we have s inverse t and s and this is nothing but the diagonal form of the matrix of t to the power n right because why because uh, this can be written as s inverse ts into s inverse ts and so on up to n terms right so this is in fact s inverse ts whole to the power n therefore this the partition function is the trace of t prime to the power of n therefore z is equal to lambda greater to the power n plus lambda lesser to the power n and in this way we arrive at this simplified form of the partition function and this can be further simplified by taking lambda greater to the power n outside the brackets. Now we see in the thermodynamic limit, n goes to infinity. And in this limit, this term over here, the second term, is of the order of e to the power of minus alpha n, where alpha is equal to log of lambda greater by lambda lesser. And it is a positive quantity. And therefore, e to the power of minus alpha n is a negative quantity. And since n goes very large, so this almost approaches zero. So in the thermodynamic limit, the partition function is effectively equal to lambda greater to the power of n. That means it is determined by the largest eigenvalue of the transfer matrix. So now we can also obtain the free energy. So free energy is nothing but k minus kbt ln z. So the free energy per site is given by f total free energy by n that is equal to minus kbt ln of lambda greater right if we neglect the second term in the thermodynamic limit now what is this value of lambda greater so we can easily obtain it from the characteristic equation of the transfer matrix and if we do the calculation uh, we obtain the, the two eigenvalues which are given by lambda over here so the two eigenvalues are e to the power k cos hyperbolic h plus minus root over sine hyperbolic square h plus e to the power of minus 4k so these are the two eigenvalues. The greater eigenvalue has the positive sign over here and the lesser eigenvalue has the negative sign. OK, so therefore the free energy is nothing but minus KBT ln of lambda greater. So you see it has the positive sign over here. All right, and this can be simplified even further. So I can write log AB into log A plus log B. If I do that, there is a K which comes out and k was beta into j and this is 1 by beta so therefore f is equal to minus j minus kbt log of cos hyperbolic h plus root over of sine hyperbolic square h plus e to the power of minus 4k so what we observe from here is that fh that is the free energy is analytic unless lambda greater equal to lambda lesser so what happens if lambda greater is equal to lambda lesser so if lambda greater and lambda lesser are both the same, then the discriminant over here, this should vanish. OK, and if the discriminant itself vanishes, then at h equal to 0, at t equal to 0, you see that f becomes non-analytic. And this happens. Therefore, this, uh, this non-analyticity of h f happens exactly at h equal to 0 and t equal to 0. So how do we see that? So we can see it. Uh, by this simple formalism over here. So let us first take, uh, suppose that t is equal to zero, or in other words, capital K goes to infinity. So when this happens, if capital K goes to infinity, then e to the power of minus 4k becomes a very small quantity, right? So it can be neglected. Therefore, we can write uh, lambda greater as e to the power k into cos hyperbolic h plus 
modulus of sine hyperbolic h by modulus because it's a square root of sine hyperbolic square. Therefore, I write it as a modulus. I only take the positive square root of sine hyperbolic h. Okay. Now, uh, cos hyperbolic h plus modulo sine hyperbolic h can be written in this manner. Okay. I can break up the two of them. So when h is greater than zero, this is equal to e to the two e to the power h by two, which is equal to e to the power h. And when h is less than zero, this is equal to two e to the power of minus h. Okay. Or in other words, this thing entire thing is equal to e to the power of mod h for all values of h. Therefore, lambda greater is equal to e to the power of k plus mod h. So I substitute this expression for in place of the free energy now. So once I do that, I get f is equal to minus kBT capital K plus mod h, right? Or in other words, f is equal to minus j plus minus j minus capital H, where capital H, uh, where yeah, where capital H is equal to small h by beta. So this is the form of free energy I get at t equal to zero. So you see that if I calculate that, why do I call it non-analytic? If I calculate the derivative of this function, so what will it look like derivative in terms of h? So this means that basically for h greater than zero, the derivative will be uh, f is f will be equal to minus j minus h. So the derivative with respect to h will be minus one. Similarly, the derivative with respect to h for h less than zero, it will be plus one. Right, because it will be a plus sign over here. Therefore, and at h equal to zero, you will see so it's a, a minus one derivative at greater than h and plus one derivative for h less than zero. Right. So you will get a curve which looks like this. It is linear like this and linear like this. And at h equal to zero, there is a kink in the curve. As a result of that, the derivative of f, f at h equal to zero does not exist. So this is the point where f becomes non-analytic because it has a slope discontinuity at h equal to zero. In other words, this can this is manifested in terms of the magnetization. So the magnetization uh, at uh, t equal to zero is equal to one if h is greater than zero, and it is equal to minus one if h is less than zero. Why? Because magnetization is equal to minus del f del h. Okay. So therefore, there is this discontinuity in the magnetization, which shows up as a spontaneous magnetization as t equal to zero. And this indicates that there is a phase transition at this point, that is at t equal to zero. However, we must note that for t greater than zero, this uh, there is no such um, transition. And this is uh, visible from the form of mod h. So we had, uh, we had taken uh, the modulus of sine hyperbolic square h over here. So when uh, t is not equal to zero, then there is this extra term within the square root, right, which is non-zero. So what happens that it will contribute some amount of epsilon square, which is non-zero, right? And if I substitute this value in place of h, then you see that the magnetization increases gradually and it passes through zero at h equal to zero instead of having this discontinuity. Therefore, there is no phase transition at any finite temperature for the 1D icing model. So now that I've spoken of magnetization and the jump in magnetization, uh, let us take a look at the form of magnetization which we derive from this free energy. So if I take a minus del f del h, I get the magnetization which is uh, kBT by lambda greater into del, del h of lambda greater. All right, so I substitute the expression of the larger eigenvalue and I take the derivative with respect to h and I make another substitution that omega squared equal to minus e to the power of minus 4k, which is the relative probability of two configurations that uh, differ by a single spin flip. Okay, because each spin flip causes costs and energy of 2j. So if I do that and calculate the magnetization, I obtain m is equal to sine hyperbolic h divided by sine hyperbolic square h plus omega square. So you see that um, f for t equal to zero, omega square will be equal to zero. In that case, m is equal to either plus minus one, depending on the sine of h, right? And uh, if it is non-zero, and there is a discontinuity over here, whereas if it is non-zero, m follows this continuous curve. Right. So whatever I said earlier, this comes out from this expression of M. 
now we further go on to calculate other quantities like the susceptibility of the system. So susceptibility is uh, given by del m by del h. So I can write this as beta into del m by del small h and I take the derivative of m with respect to small h. And if I do that, I get chi t is equal to omega square by kbt cos hyperbolic h divided by sine hyperbolic square plus omega square whole to the power of 3 by 2. OK, so let us look at the properties of susceptibility in case of different limits. So when uh, the external field is not equal to zero, as t approaches zero from the right hand side, we find that chi t approaches a finite value. Why? Because if this is non-zero and this is zero, you will see that chi t has a finite value even as t approaches zero. So in this limit, um, this thing we this thing is of order one and it approaches a finite value which depends upon h. On the other hand, if h is equal to zero, then if chi t approaches zero, we have basically this um, sine hyperbolic square is equal to zero and cos hyperbolic is equal to one in that case. Therefore, chi t is equal to omega square by kbt into omega cube, which is equal to one by omega kbt. This is nothing but e to the power of two beta j by kbt. So as t goes to zero, we find that uh, chi t diverges exponentially, right? Because this e to the power quantity, it goes off to infinity. And uh, we find that in the limit of large temperature, that is large t, this becomes of the order unity and then chi t goes as 1 by kbt, which is nothing but Curie's law, which we had covered in the earlier lectures. OK, so in this way, one can recover the properties of chi t from this Ising model itself. Now let us take a look at the uh, most important part of the Ising model, that is the interactions. So how do we quantify interactions? We quantify them with the help of correlation functions. So since here we have the spin variables, we consider spin-spin correlation functions, that is correlation between diff different spins. And one can consider correlation function between two spins, three spins, four spins, and n number of spins in general. So first, let us take a look at the one-point correlation function. The one-point correlation function is nothing but this uh, magnetization. Okay, so this is the expectation value of SI. Now expectation of Sn is equal to summation over all spin configurations Sn e to the power of minus beta h divided by the total number of all possible configurations. Basically, I'm taking a mean of this quantity. OK. So I can uh, expand this uh, summation in terms of the elements of the transfer matrix, which we had seen earlier. So if I do that, I get the expansion of this form. And there you'll see there is a value of Sn which lies between somewhere because small n lies between 0 and capital N, right? And then we can uh, further break this down into a basis of Sn and Sn prime vectors if we use the poly matrix. Okay, so sigma z is the third poly matrix which we use over here. If we do that, you see that the expectation value of Sn turns out to be equal to trace of t to the power of n minus 1 sigma z t to the power of n minus capital N minus small n minus 1 divided by the partition function. So if I do this calculation, we find that this is nothing but trace of sigma z t to the power n divided by trace of t to the power n. All right. Now again, we use, we uh, pre-multiply each by each of these traces, the left hand side by s, s, s inverse. If we do that, and if we make certain um, mathematical modifications then we uh, in the numerator we obtain a form like trace of s inverse sigma z into s into s inverse ts to the power of n and in the denominator we obtain this trace of s inverse ts to the power of n okay so now let us uh, find what is the form of this matrix s so once we get the form of the matrix s we'll be able to evaluate this trace exactly Right, because since S is unknown, we can't evaluate this trace over here, this trace of S inverse sigma Z S. So let us suppose that uh, S inverse sigma Z S can be written in this manner, A, B, C, D, which are the four elements of the matrices. Okay, so if it is possible to write, uh, 
if we denote this by this general matrix of a b c d now since s inverse t s is uh, uh, written by this diagonal matrix then if we substitute this part over here we obtain the mean value of the spin that is the magnetization to be a into lambda greater to the power n plus d into lambda less to the power n divided by lambda greater to the power n plus lambda less to the power n now we need to find the values of a b c and d so how do we do that so let uh, u1 and u2 be two orthogonal vectors of the transfer matrix t then since they are orthogonal to each other their inner product is zero and we assume orthonormality also therefore the inner product of each vector with itself is equal to one so let us denote u1 by alpha plus alpha minus and u2 by alpha minus minus alpha plus okay so this uh, implies that alpha plus square plus alpha minus square is equal to one okay now if i uh, use this uh, invariance of now if i you now since uh, u1 and u2 are the eigenvectors of the transfer matrix we can write this eigenvalue equation t into u1 is equal to lambda greater u1 where u1 corresponds to the larger eigenvalue and u2 corresponds to the smaller eigenvalue okay so if from this particular um, eigenvalue equation we can obtain the uh, two equations for alpha plus and alpha minus in terms of the elements of the transfer matrix and the eigenvalues lambda greater lambda lesser right so if we solve this then we obtain alpha minus square is equal to t11 minus lambda greater divided by t22 plus t11 minus 2 lambda greater so once we get alpha minus square or alpha minus we can obtain alpha plus square by using this formula that alpha plus square is equal to 1 minus alpha minus square right so if we substitute so once we get alpha minus square we basically substitute the values of these quantities and if we do that we obtain alpha minus square is equal to half into 1 minus sine hyperbolic h divided by sine hyperbolic square h plus omega square so as i said earlier alpha plus square is equal to 1 minus alpha minus square and this is equal to this quantity so the elements of the matrix so the columns of the matrix s are nothing but its eigenvectors therefore s is equal to alpha plus alpha minus alpha minus alpha plus and therefore s inverse can be written in this manner and since this is a symmetric matrix s inverse is equal to s transpose so basically s inverse is equal to the transpose of s right so now we can calculate s inverse sigma z s by say uh, using these forms of the matrix s if we do that we obtain that uh, the left hand side is equal to alpha plus square minus alpha minus square to alpha plus alpha minus on each side and alpha minus square plus alpha plus square so you see that this is another uh, symmetric matrix and more importantly we now obtain the values of a b c d so if you remember i had written this matrix as a b c and d so here we get b equal to c equal to 2 alpha plus into alpha minus and a is equal to minus t which is equal to alpha plus square minus alpha minus square and alpha plus square minus alpha minus square is equal to sigma hyperbolic h sine hyperbolic h by sine hyperbolic square h plus omega square square root so once we do that we can calculate the magnetization using this formula which we obtained earlier so this is equal to a into lambda greater to the power n minus lambda less to the power n divided by lambda greater to the power n plus lambda less to the power n so in the thermodynamic limit the lambda greater the, the larger eigen value dominates right so then magnetization is nothing but the value of a which is equal to sine hyperbolic h divided by sine hyperbolic square h plus omega square and this is the same as what we had obtained earlier right so earlier we had obtained the value of magnetization to be this by considering the thermodynamic limit at finite t and so here also by calculating the mean value of the spin over all possible configurations we arrive at the same value of magnetization now let us take a look at what the two point correlation function looks like okay so this is important for quantifying the interaction between the nearest neighbor spins so two point correlation function is nothing but the mean value of si into si plus j or the 
if we consider the two spins, the correlation function between two spins on a 1D lattice is separated by R, then this is equal to expectation of Sn, Sn plus R. So let us evaluate this function. So expectation Sn, Sn plus R is equal to summation over all configurations, Sn, Sn plus R into the power minus beta H divided by the partition function. All right, so again, we follow the same formalism where we express the numerator and denominator in terms of the elements of the transfer matrix. OK, and then we again use the uh, poly spin matrices to express the spins Sn and Sn plus R as well. So once we do that, we get an expression of this form trace of t to the power n minus one sigma z t to the power of sigma z t to the power n minus R minus small n plus one. And if we simplify this expression, we obtain this to be trace of sigma z t to the power r sigma z t to the power n minus r. Right. So this is all pretty simple. So basically, I have done use this manipulation of the cyclic uh, form of the trace. So it does not change on the cyclic permutations. So I basically took t to the power n minus one on this side, and then this n minus term one term cancelled out over here. Okay. So again, I can uh, introduce these matrices S, S, S and S inverse over here, and I can manipulate this quantity over here so as to write an expansion of this particular form. And so if we do that, and uh, we substitute uh, the values of S inverse sigma Z S as A, B, C, D, then you will see that this particular uh, expansion can be written in this manner over here, where we have this matrix A, B, C, D, multiplying this matrix T to the power R. Again, you have a matrix A, B, C, D, which comes from here, multiplying the matrix T to the power N minus R. So if we do these matrix multiplications, then we arrive at this huge matrix. Okay. And then we have to find the trace of this matrix. So the trace of this matrix gives us the correlation function. So trace is nothing but a squared lambda greater to the power n plus bc lambda plus to the power r lambda greater to the power n minus r plus bc lambda greater to the power r lambda less to the power n minus r plus t squared lambda less to the power n. So this is the trace of the matrix which I wrote over here in the numerator and the denominator is the partition function which we had earlier. Now if I take the thermodynamic limit that is capital N going to infinity now, since lambda greater to the power n is the dominant term over here. So what we do is that we neglect all the other smaller terms, right? So then the numerator becomes a square lambda greater to the power n. BC, I take lambda greater to the power n common from here. Then the first term becomes lambda less by lambda greater whole to the power capital N minus R. And the second term is lambda less by lambda greater whole to the power R. So in the limit of n going to infinity, this term goes to zero. And then I am left with the left hand side to be equal to a square plus bc into lambda less by lambda greater whole to the power r. So this is the form of the spin spin correlation function between two spins separated by r on a one dimensional lattice in the thermodynamic limit. Okay, so this is the expectation. And then, then if I subtract the variance of the spin, so, sorry, if I subtract the mean squared value of the spin, I get the correlation function. So mean squared value of the spin was a square, right? So if I subtract a square from here, I obtain the spin spin correlation function, which I denote as gamma. So gamma is a function of R, temperature, magnetic field, and a, J, right? So all these values, they come into these quantities B and C and lambda less and lambda greater. So the spin spin correlation function is written as gamma r, which is equal to bc into lambda less by lambda greater whole to the power r. Now let us substitute the expressions of bc. So we saw that b equal to c equal to 2 alpha plus into alpha minus. Right. So then bc is equal to 4 alpha square into alpha minus square. So then um, if I substitute the values of alpha plus and alpha minus, this is what I obtain. And therefore, the spin spin correlation function is given by this huge complicated form over here. 
So let us take a look at the behavior of this function in the zero fill limit. So when h is equal to zero, this term becomes zero. So omega squared by omega squared is equal to one. Cos hyperbolic is equal to one. This is equal to one, zero and zero. So this basically becomes one minus omega divided by one plus omega raised to the power r. Or omega is uh, yes, and omega is nothing but e to the power of minus two k. So therefore, this is equal to one minus e to the power minus two k by one plus e to the power minus two k whole to the power of r. And this is equal to tan hyperbolic k whole to the power r. So you see we are at the simplified form of the spin spin correlation function when the external magnetic field is equal to zero. That is g of r is equal to tan hyperbolic beta j whole to the power r. So one thing which we can directly see from here is that g of r is translationally invariant. That means it only depends on the separation between the two spins. It does not depend upon the positions of the spins in my lattice. OK, so regardless of where we choose the spins are, as long as the separation is fixed, the g of r between the two spins will be fixed. It also applies to finite size systems as long as the spins we choose are not near the boundaries of the system and the system has periodic boundary conditions. So here we had periodic boundary conditions. Therefore, it was not a problem for us. OK. Now for h equal to zero, this is the form of the correlation function we get. Now if we put t equal to zero as well, then beta goes to infinity and tan hyperbolic of infinity is one. Therefore, g of r is equal to one for h equal to zero and t equal to zero. What does this physically mean? This the fact that the correlation function is equal to one means that there is long range order in the system. That means every spin is correlated, highly correlated with each other. There is perfect correlation between the spins and this happens at t equal to zero. Physically, this means that at zero temperature in the absence of any magnetic field, all these spins will be pointing in a particular direction and therefore all the spins are ordered. Therefore, g is equal to one over here. Therefore, at 0k, the probability that Sn is equal to Sn plus 1, Sn, Sn and Sn plus R are equal is equal to 1 for all R. So therefore, this is a perfectly correlated state and the system shows long range order as I mentioned earlier. Now for T not equal to 0, we have K not equal to infinity. So if T is not equal to 0, this quantity is no longer 1, but it is less than 1. OK, and as you see that as you increase T, G of R becomes lesser and lesser. So the spins become more and more decorrelated as we raise the temperature. Or in other words, you one can see that the correlation function will decrease exponentially for T greater than zero. Why? Because if uh, G of R is written by tan hyperbolic H, which can be written as an inverse of the cot hyperbolic H function. Right now, if I uh, now the right hand side can be written as e to the power of minus R log of cot hyperbolic H. And suppose I denote the uh, length scale as i as 1 by log of cot hyperbolic h over here. So then g of r can be written as e to the power of minus r by xi. So xi is better known as the correlation length. So it is a measure of the distance up to which the correlation function, the correlation persists between spins. So basically it is the distance up to which at which the correlation function decreases to 1 by e of its initial value. Right, so it's a measure of the length over which the spins are correlated with probability of the order of 1. So as t goes to infinity, beta goes to 0 and therefore this quantity goes to 1. And so this quantity goes to 0. Therefore xi goes to infinity as t goes, sorry, I'm sorry, as t goes to infinity, a beta goes to zero and cot hyperbolic goes to infinity, right? Therefore, xi goes to zero. Therefore, correlation length becomes almost zero in the limit of very high temperatures because the spins are uncorrelated. Also, as t approaches zero, we find that the correlation length goes to infinity. So now the question is, how does xi diverge to infinity as t approaches zero? So now cot hyperbolic k can be written as e to the power k plus e to the power minus k divided by e to the power k minus e to the power minus k. Right. So as k approaches infinity, 
cot hyperbolic can be written in this particular form. So I take k common outside the denominator and therefore this becomes 1 plus e to the power minus 2k and this becomes 1 plus e to the power minus 2k if I do a binomial expansion. Okay. And therefore it can be written as 1 plus 2 e to the power minus 2k plus higher order terms of the order of e to the power minus 4k which can be neglected. So therefore uh, once we do that, we see that as I can be written as 1 by log of 1 plus 2 to the power minus 2k. So if I use the Taylor series expansion of log in the limit of very small x and log of 1 plus x is almost equal to x. Right. Therefore, I can write the log of this quantity as uh, 2 e to the power minus 2k. And if I do that, I see that xi is equal to e to the power 2k by 2 or xi is equal to e to the power 2 beta j by 2. Therefore, we see that it goes to infinity exponentially as t goes to zero. So there is an essential singularity in the correlation length as t approaches zero, which is the critical temperature for the one dimensional icing model. Why critical temperature? Because this is the temperature at which the phase transition can occur or the phase transition meaning that the system can go from a state of zero spontaneous magnetization to finite spontaneous magnetization. Now you see from the expression of G of R, one can also write Xi in terms of the eigenvalues of the transfer matrix. So Xi can also be written as one by lambda greater by lambda lesser. So you see that uh, this quantity can diverge only when lambda greater is equal to lambda lesser. So that is when uh, Xi diverges. Okay. And since lambda, because um, yes, so since lambda greater is less than lambda lesser, this quantity is always positive and therefore xi decays exponentially for t greater than zero. Now we have seen that there is no phase transition in the model for d equal to one. That is the d equal to one dimensional icing model has no phase transition at t greater than zero. Now let us see what happens. Now this this is what we obtained from our numerical uh, results. I'm sorry, our analytic results from the transfer matrix method. Now let us look take a look at a few more heuristic arguments in terms of entropy and free energy as to why there is no transition at t equal to zero. Uh, sorry, at t greater than zero, and then we can extend these arguments to show that there is in fact a transition at a finite temperature for the higher dimensions. So this energy entropy argument is also known as the Landau Pearls argument for this case. So what is the Landau Pearls argument? So they showed that for t greater than zero and d equal to one dimension, there is no long range order, but for d equal to zero and at finite temperature, there is a long range order with a critical transition temperature of Tc being greater than zero. Okay. So the dimension above which a critical uh, given phase transition occurs at a finite temperature is known as a critical lower critical dimension. So for this kind of icing model with nearest neighbor coupling, the critical dimension for the phase transition to take place is equal to 2. Now at t equal to 0, all spins are pointing up and we assume periodic boundary conditions. So as the temperature is raised, there is a certain number of spins which flip the direction and point in the other way, right? Because fluctuations increase with temperature. Now in the thermodynamic limit, if there is an uncorrelated flip of n small number of spins, then we see that uh, an uncorrelated flip of smaller number of spins is unable to destroy long range order. Why? Because limit of capital N going to infinity n in n capital N minus small n by capital N is always equal to one. So if there is an uncorrelated uh, flip of spins, that means there are spins flipping randomly, then this won't destroy long range order in the thermodynamic limit. So it can only be destroyed if there is a correlated flip of spins or in other words, there is a sub substantial fraction of the total number of particles which flip their spins. Right. 
so therefore what we see is that in the ordered state at equal to zero the entropy is equal to zero now the free energy functional it can be defined as f is equal to e minus ts where e is the internal energy of the system okay so at t equal to zero e is equal to minus nj in the absence of any field right if you remember the hamiltonian in the absence of any external field the hamiltonian was minus j into summation i si into si plus one so since all the si's are pointing in the same directions there will be an n number of summation of ones therefore e is equal to minus nj now suppose i raise the temperature then i get one of the spins to flip okay so one of if one of the spin flips then this is the situation that i get right so there is a flip of spin over here and the flipping of spin results in the formation of two domain walls two domain walls are basically are uh, representing the interaction of the flip spins with the nearest neighbor spins right so basically there is an energy cost associated with the flipping of spins and what is the energy cost the energy cost is minus j into s i remember the hamiltonian which we had earlier so the earlier the energy was minus nj now it will be minus of n minus 1 nj plus j plus j right so there is so there is 1j coming from here 1j coming from here due to the interaction of the flips in flips spin with the nearest neighbors so there is an energy cost of 2j associated with a given spin therefore the internal energy of this system in this state is equal to minus nj plus 2j or in other words equal to minus n minus 1 into j as i mentioned earlier plus j which comes from the flipping of the spins okay now let us take a look at the entropy of the system so earlier the entropy was equal to zero because there were no possible no flips of spins now the flipping of the spin can occur at any of the n possible sites right so there can be n number of microstates corresponding to give this given macro state therefore the entropy for this configuration is equal to kb ln n so if i substitute this in the expression for the free energy i get f equal to minus nj plus 2j minus kb ln n so the free energy difference between the earlier and the new configuration is given by 2j minus kb e ln n okay where t is now a finite quantity now in the thermodynamic limit i have n going to infinity therefore this term becomes infinity and delta f becomes negative therefore we find that at finite temperatures the one dimensional icing model is able to lower its free energy by flipping its spins or in other words the disordered state appears to be the more stable state than the ordered one at finite temperature so therefore there is no phase transition there is no long range order in the system for t greater than 0 and therefore the phase transitions do not occur at t greater than 0 so this is the energy entropy argument um we can also formulate a generalization of this energy entropy argument so here we are assume that the coupling is only between the nearest neighbor spins now let us assume a more continuous form of the coupling okay that is let us suppose that the 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 spin spin coupling parameter j it decreases in the form of a power law of r okay so it decreases with distance r in the form of a power law so for j of r is equal to j r to the power of minus sigma where here j is a constant and the coupling is between the n and n plus rth spin okay so therefore what happens if we now flip start flipping spins one by one so when we flip one spin then the domain wall energy is given by this particular formula why because the flip spin will be interacting not only with its nearest neighbor spins now but with all the spins which are there in its neighborhood by with the help of this interaction term therefore the extra energy that is the domain wall energy can be written as uh so in, as an integral over r1 and r2 into r1 minus r2 raised to the power of minus sigma right because this r2 goes from 1 to n and r1 also goes from 1 to n basically they go along the positions of the spin on the single domain and this is equal to j n to the power of 2 minus sigma 
then in that case the change in free energy is given by delta f equal to j of the order of j n to the power of 2 minus sigma plus kbt ln n now here is the interesting thing which you observe over here so if uh, sigma is uh, greater than 2 then you will see that uh, greater than or equal to 2 then you will find that uh, this quantity is much smaller than this quantity in the limit of n going to infinity right so then again the delta f becomes 0 and the system tends to a disordered state but if sigma lies between 1 and 2 then the domain wall energy term that is this term this is the one which domain dominates over the logarithm of n therefore the long range order tends to persist up to a certain critical temperature so if i raise the temperature further and further then the difference between these two terms diminishes and there finally comes a temperature when this term starts dominating over this term and that is when the phase transition takes place and that temperature we denote as the critical temperature tc so if instead of nearest neighbor coupling in the 1d icing model if i had a coupling which decayed gradually in the form of a power law then you see that there is a probability of there being a phase transition at a finite temperature right or in other words long range order can persist at finite temperatures now let us take a look at what happens for d equal to 2 if we consider only nearest neighbor interactions so uh, in the 2d icing model suppose we have a domain of spins so here this is the domain of our system over here where all spins are pointing up and within this domain there is a certain fraction of spins which point downwards okay so because of the fraction of spins which point downwards there is a discontinuity between the spins over here and the spin over here along this boundary so there is a domain wall energy associated with this boundary right and suppose the, there are n number of spins in this boundary so there are n number of bonds between the down spins and up spins along the domain wall then the domain wall energy is given by delta e which is equal to 2jn so this is the energy difference between the configuration uh, between the free energy uh, between the internal energy at t equal to 0 and the internal energy in this new state okay now suppose the coordination number of the lattice is z that means each spin in the lattice has z nearest neighbors we now think of the number of ways which in which we can construct the boundary with the same n number of bonds starting from some point on the boundary itself so this gives me the total number of microstates which corresponds to this macrostate having the same domain wall energy that is the same perimeter of the domain wall so basically i start from one domain wall one point on the domain wall and from that point i can go in any one of the z minus one possible directions right because that is the coordination number of this lattice so i can move to the next step in z minus one ways from the next step i can move to the subsequent step in z minus num one possible number of ways and since there are small n number of bonds the total number of ways i can move is given by z1 z minus one to the power of n so this basically tells me the number of ways i can construct the domain wall having the same parameter of n or this is the number of microstates corresponding to my macrostate therefore the entropy is given by kb log of this quantity minus kb log of this quantity and therefore the free energy is equal to 2jn minus kbt ln z minus 1 to the part n all right or in other words delta f is equal to 2j minus kbt into ln z minus 1 this entire thing multiplied by small n so we see that um, delta f is positive as long as kbt log z and lo log z minus 1 is greater less than 2j and it is negative the other way around so there exists a temperature at which delta f goes from being positive to negative right and this temperature is known as a critical temperature so critical temperature for the two dimensional icing model with nearest neighbor coupling is given by 2j divided by kb into ln z minus 1 okay this is the critical temperature so below this critical temperature we find that delta f is positive therefore the long range order is pre uh, pre preferred is the preferred state on the other hand if we go above the critical temperature then the long range order tends to disintegrate and the 
favored state is the one which has less order or the disordered state is the favored state in that case. So there is a, a phase transition at a finite temperature for the 2D icing model. OK, so here is a low temperature expansion which we can perform on the D dimensional icing model. I won't go through it much because it does not give much important result, but you can go through it if you want to. The next thing which I will cover today is the mapping of icing models to classical fluid models. So here I'll show that the icing model can uh, not only be used to um, model uh, magnetic systems, but it can also be used to model certain classical fluids. How do we do that? So in the previous classes also we had uh, seen classical fluid models, but over there we had neglected the interactions, right? So now let us consider different kinds of interactions. So then the Hamiltonian will of a continuous fluid of capital N particles in a box with an external potential of U can be written in this form where it is summation I equal to 1 to N. Pi square by 2M is the kinetic energy of the free particle plus U1, which is the external potential plus half into U2 RIRJ plus one third factorials U3 RIRJ RK and so on. So what are these extra potentials? So this potential energy term is the potential energy due to interaction of a particle with its nearest neighbor. And the two factorial is there to avoid overcounting. This one accounts for the potential between interaction potential between three particles. And again, the three factorial accounts for the overcounting. So here I have uh, included the interaction potential among the many particles over here. All right, so what do we do in this case? So the general thing that we do is that we write it. Uh, we write a partition function for this system, the grand partition function, which is given by trace of e to the power of minus beta h minus mu n. So again, I can the trace can be written in terms of a summation over n equal to zero to infinity one by n into product over all the momentum and position coordinates and then integral over them. Right. So this n factorial term is used to avoid overcounting. So if I calculate the momentum integrals because they are only Gaussian integrals, they come out of the integration. And then what I'm left with is an integral like this. So this term basically gives me uh, the contribution of the form e to the power beta mu by lambda t to the power d whole to the power n, where lambda t is the thermal wavelength. And there is a zn term over here. So the zn term is basically this integral over here, which is the integral over all the many body potentials. That is the integral over the potential energy. So this we know, uh, rename as the configuration integral. Now let us take a look at the lattice gas model. So lattice gas model is basically the model of, of a fluid where the fluid, uh, where we map this fluid onto a lattice and we study the variations of the fluid properties at the positions of the lattice themselves. And we see that this can be directly mapped to the one the icing model. So the basic idea is to relate the local density of the particles in the fluid to the local spin up and spin down density of the magnet. So consider a d-dimensional lattice with coordination number equal to z. The lattice spacing is small a. Each site can be occupied by a single molecule. So each site can either be occupied by a single molecule or it may not be occupied by any molecule at all. So the maximum number of molecules that can be occupied per site is equal to one. So therefore, Ni can either be zero or one where I represents the ith site. And therefore, the total number of molecules capital N is equal to summation I Ni. Therefore, one can think of Ni to be the microscopic density of the fluid. Okay. So then the Hamiltonian can be written in terms of these variables N alpha or Ni as well. So the first term is basically summation alpha 1 to N U1 N alpha, where U1 is the external potential. Then I have the two body potential, which is summation I comma J U2 N alpha and beta, the three body potential and so on. So this is the Hamiltonian of the lattice gas. Now in the grand canonical ensemble, we have a, the Hamiltonian gets modified as H minus mu N. Therefore, we have this extra factor of minus summation alpha mu N alpha coming here. Okay. 
So now we derive the lattice gas model from the configuration sum of the fluids. So what we do is that we now try to evaluate the configuration sum, which we had earlier over here. So the configuration sum can be written in this manner. So summation over all microstates, product I equal to 1 to capital N, DDRI is of the order of A to the power of TN, where A is the lattice spacing, into summation alpha equal to 1 to capital N. So basically, this is a summation over all lattice positions. So the configuration sum can be written in this manner. If we assume that the A is less than or equal to the hardcore radius, that means the so basically we assume that within one lattice site, there cannot be more than one molecule. OK. Now the interaction energy between two particles may be replaced by the interaction between energy between the occupied cells. So U2, U2 Ri Rj, we can write as U alpha beta, where alpha and beta are two occupied cells. So now we assume that the forces are short range. That means U alpha beta is equal to zero unless alpha and beta are the nearest neighbors. So this is like as you like going back to the icing model with nearest neighbor interactions. So unless they're nearest neighbor, there is no interactions. If they're nearest neighbors, then the interaction is given by U alpha beta. And this nearest neighbor interaction can be chosen to be a constant for further simplification. So we choose it to be equal to U2. OK. Now summation over N alpha can be written in this form also. Right. So then the, the configuration integral Zn can be written as n factorial a to the power dn summation over all configurations e to the power of minus beta u, where u is the potential energy and n alpha can take values of 0 and 1. All right, so then the grand partition function can be written if I substitute the expression of z over there. Why do they have the factorial of n? Why do they have this n factorial here? Because there are n factorial number of configurations, right? So if I bring in this factor over here, then the constraint on the configuration sum gets removed easily. OK, so here is the configuration integral, which I had earlier, and then this is the configuration sum. Now, since we have the summation over n equal to 0 to infinity and this summation over n alpha, so therefore the constraint on the n alpha is completely removed now. OK, therefore, we write this, we can remove, we can then remove the summation over n equal to zero to infinity and write Qn as a configuration of sum over this quantity into e to the power of minus beta u. All right, now we make further manipulations to this expression over here. And if we do that, we get an expression for Q which looks like this. Okay, so this looks similar to our earlier expression of H minus mu n. So here, this is the Hamiltonian of the lattice gas now. This is the partition function of the lattice gas. If we compare this with the expression of H minus mu n, then this is H and this is mu. OK, so this is the lattice gas Hamiltonian, which we write as U alpha beta and alpha and beta plus higher order terms, which might be there or might not be there. And this is the effective chemical potential, which is the chemical potential of the lattice gas, which is equal to mu plus d k b t ln a by lambda t. So here we had assumed u1 was equal to 0. So if u1 was not equal to 0, then we will have another extra term u1 over here. Now let us see how this maps to the icing model. So the n, n alpha was the occupation number. It could either be 1 or 0. So we can write it in terms of spin variables as alpha as n alpha is equal to half 1 plus s alpha, where s alpha can take values of plus 1 and minus 1. Plus one corresponds to upspin, minus one to downspin. Okay, so for upspins, we find that n alpha is equal to one, and for downspins, n alpha is equal to zero. So downspin of the icing model basically represents a vacancy, and upspin implies an occupancy. Okay, in this way, the icing model can be directly mapped to a lattice gas. Therefore, in this way, s alpha plus equal to plus one denotes the high density phase, and the minus one denotes the low density phase. Now, if we use the icing variables in the expression of the Hamiltonian, what we get is as follows. So here we replace n alpha by half into 1 plus s alpha, 
and we replace an alpha and n beta similarly. And then the first term, it becomes half into summation alpha u alpha minus mu <coughs> plus half into u alpha minus mu into s alpha, summation over alpha. And the second term can be written in terms of s alpha and s beta in this manner. So if the forces between the fluid particles are short ranged and we can neglect the higher order interaction terms, we can then the already higher order terms become zero and we can further assume that the u alpha beta is a constant. Therefore, u alpha beta is equal to u2 if alpha and beta are nearest neighbors or zero otherwise. So if we take u alpha beta to be a constant, then this terms come out of the summation. So this gives me a factor of n omega Z, n into Z, since Z is the nearest neighbor coordination number. Okay. Again, you have uh, U2 coming out of the sum over here, multiplied by Z into summation over alpha S alpha. And then you have U2 by 4 into summation over alpha beta S alpha beta over here. And the first term, it becomes nothing but uh, minus mu by 2 N minus mu by 2 summation alpha S alpha. Okay. So if we evaluate this entire summation, we can uh, write the Hamiltonian in this manner as uh, E0 minus H into summation ISI minus summation J IJ SISJ. So if you remember, this looks like the icing model Hamiltonian only, except that this has this external energy term. So this external energy uh, can be written in terms of these potentials in this particular manner. And then if from this also you will see that we can draw the equivalence between the magnetic field which we had in the icing models and the effective chemical potentials and the other potential terms which we have over here. So the equivalence is like this. So H is equal to mu bar by 2 minus U2 Z by 4. So this is what H turns out to be. And the coupling term Z, sorry, sorry J, J is equal to minus U2 by 4. All right. So you see, this is what this is the coupling we had for the spin spin coupling in the icing model. This can be related to the two body potential, which we have in case of a lattice gas. Right. So in this way, we can uh, denote the grand partition function. In terms of the icing model partition function itself. So this is nothing but the icing model partition function multiplied by e to the power of minus beta E0 because we have this extra E0 in the energy over here. OK, so the thermodynamic properties of the lattice gas can be directly obtained from the thermodynamic properties of the icing model in that case. That is the free energy can be calculated if I take the log of Q. So log of Q gives me minus beta E0 plus log Z. right? And all the expressions for log Z I can easily get if I evaluate the icing model. After evaluating the icing model, what I have to do is that in place of J and H, I have to basically substitute these expressions. And then I can easily calculate the properties of a lattice gas from the icing model. So this is a very useful equivalence which we found over here. So in the thermodynamic limit, one can find the expressions for the pressure of the icing gas by simply taking PV is equal to KB TLNQ, which we had done earlier. And the average occupation number density, average occupation number, which was basically the magnetization which we had for the icing spins. Uh, sorry, the average occupation number over here. That means the density per site can be related to the magnetization of the icing model. So we can calculate the magnetization of the icing model. And from that, we can calculate directly the microscopic density per site of the lattice gas. Right. So therefore, a lattice gas has two density phases. One is the more dense phase, which corresponds to the spin up phase. So the up spin phase corresponds to S alpha equal to 1. And then this will correspond to 1 by AD, A to the power D. And there is a dilute phase where the density is 0, which is the low density phase, which corresponds to the downspin of the icing model. OK, so this is whatever which I had to uh, cover in this particular class. So yeah, I'll uh, stop the recording now and stop sharing my screen. Rest of the things we'll cover in the next class.